Uh, I'd like to actually sort of piggyback on a lot of the, um, the great stuff that has been discussed today. I'm going to draw upon um, some of the, the ideas and theory that um, has already been discussed uh, with a view to analyzing signals uh, that you really have no idea about. So I'll try and sort of keep it light as the last one of the day, and I would really like to appeal to the hacker in all of you in terms of actually peeling back the layers on, on a signal that um, is coming out of the, uh, the ether, in this case the sky. I'll look at terrestrial and um, those coming down from, from satellites. Now, oh. so a bit of a recap. Obviously, there are lots of different types of satellites. Um, I won't go through the details because we just heard um, some things about existing ones, but I'm going to concentrate on the, the dumb ones, so to speak, those with linear transponders. And uh, in that case, they're usually used to uh, rebroadcast digital TV over a large area of the Earth. So the signal originally comes up from a ground station, hits the tr linear transponder, and then is rebroadcast with spot beams to cover an entire country, and that's how you can watch your direct TV and have your little dish receiving the signal. Um, I'll skip this because we just heard about the telemetry. Um, the other thing, though, is uplink power control. I'll come back to that. That's just used generally to control the amount of power that a transmit station has to use. Uh, if there's a clear sky, then you don't have to use all that much power, but if, if there's a lot of rain or moisture in the atmosphere, then they usually have to crank it up considerably. But um, I thought... It would be cool to connect a USRP to a, um, a dish, and really all you need is, is the radio and a set-top box that you would, you would use with the um, IF out after being down-converted from, say, 11 gigahertz. Now, this is the Optus D1 satellite that is in geostationary orbit above Australia. It has um, a few transponders on board, operates in these frequencies, and is mainly used for TV, and it also has some other interesting things. But you can download the spec sheet for the satellite. It'll give you all of the frequencies, those that are used by the uh, telemetry uh, downlinks. Uh, so this is all freely available. You can look that up. And this is their little photo tour through their Earth station in Sydney, or just outside of Sydney. Uh, if you look at the frequencies that are actually linked into there via microwave using uh, the government data that's on this mashup, then you can see all of the various uh, other companies that uh, deliver the actual video content there. The other thing is if you look at their racks, then you may recognize that they use particular uh, types of modems. In this case, it's the DMD15. And the cool thing then is that you can actually go online, download the manual for the modem, and then figure out how it works, what sort of parameters are configurable, and then look at applying that. Again, more photos of their rack equipment. If you do a bit of Googling around, you can find out exactly what they are. And if you look a little bit closer, then you can see one of their other satellites is the uh, C1 satellite, and this is the uplink um, power control unit for that that's used to track it. Uh, so what do you actually need to do to analyze such a signal? Well, obviously you need a satellite, a dish, uh, an LNB, low noise block converter, or down converter, and a USRP, for an example. It pays to actually spend a little bit more money. You can get really cheap LNBs, which are good for much uh, broader band signals like satellite TV. But if you want to look at the narrower stuff, then uh, it's, it's always good to get one with a higher stability oscillator inside the unit. Uh, in this case, this subtracts 11.3 gig, and then you get your uh, down converter signal that is nicely received by, for example, a WBX. Uh, the other thing you can do is, if you know the satellite that you're actually looking at, you can do some more Googling, and as it happens, the manufacturers of various components of the payload might actually list the satellites that contain their uh, equipment. So this is the um, high-power transmitter that's used for the beacon signal, and it's neat because there are the Optus satellites, a uh, little diagram about how it works, and it also tells you the sort of modulation that uh, they're using, so you can bear that in mind. And this is actually the uh, D1 telemetry downlink. And if you have a look, you've got, uh, it's phase modulated, so you have a constant um, carrier in the middle, and that's kind of neat because 
you can use it to estimate the sort of power coming down. And you have telemetry coming out on these sidebands. You've also got one pulse per second in another sideband there. And that's kind of cool because that's the heartbeat of the satellites. It, it's letting everybody know that's listening on the, on the ground that, yes, I'm alive. Um, so the other cool thing then is that you can take these sidebands, do a little bit of processing. I'll show you that in, in a second. And then visualize the bitstream. Now, I have no idea what's actually encoded in the bitstream. That would take uh, considerably more time to, to reverse engineer. But just a very, very initial cursory glance can reveal some structures. Um, if you look at these sort of triangular structures here, can anybody give a hint as to what that might be? Remember, this is just a binary stream over time. Exactly. It's just a counter. So you can actually see that some element of it contains a counter. It's counting up. And that is probably a good indicator that things are, are happy. So you can, you know, that is one starting point. Uh, this is the uh, those two sidebands visualized in Boardline. Has anybody used Boardline or heard, heard of Boardline? Oh, great. Okay. I think it's a really, really slick tool. It, it uh, complements GNU Radio, especially very, very nicely. Uh, if you would pipe it in to some sort of a flow graph. This is the sort of analysis uh, flow graph that I've been using. Then you can put in the right parameters, and there you go. You've got your uh, partially demodulated signal. Obviously, it doesn't look nearly as nice as what we saw before, but of course, it's just uh, just a start. Um, I've modified a couple of blocks. This is uh, an MPSK receiver. I've actually added all these outputs that continually output the internal state of the uh, the receiver, and that's kind of neat because you can feed real signals through and see how they track over time. So that's uh, what's that one? That's frequency and that's phase. Uh, this is actually an exa another example of a different transponder on the satellite. So there are all sorts of signals up there, and um, obviously you've got the raw data and they do things to it. Um, these are the sort of standard things I won't go through them because I'm sure you're all familiar. But the trick is, of course, going back the other way, there are all sorts of parameters that you would have to search through and guess to actually recover any information from this mysterious data. And it, there can be so many, it will make your head uh, 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 explode, for those of you that are familiar with Strong Bad. Now, uh, so if you don't know, then y you need to do some research, some Googling. So you need to read the modem manual. Uh, commonly, Phase shift keying is used. Uh, in older sort of systems, the NASA K7 convolutional uh, code is very, very popular. Now people have been moving to turbo codes, which makes things much more complicated. Uh, and also a scrambler is used, and the um, Intel SAT business server scrambler is also a very popular one. That'll, that'll teach me for using Windows. I love it. All these Linux boxes are boring. Um, I could could have used this one, but this has got um, Linux running on there, so I can show you some GR stuff. All right, do you mind talking amongst yourselves for a moment? <laughs> Again, sorry about this. Uh, boot from local hard drive. Oh, shit. And now it's booting into Linux, and I want to boot into Windows. All I did was move ahead one slide. I didn't even try plugging in a scanner or anything. I'm just thinking if there's anything I can show you in the meantime, but it might uh, be a bit risky.
Can I also, in the meantime, ask you all, who has uh, heard or used WinRAD or HDSDR? Or, yeah, a couple. Uh, can I have a show of hands of who hates it or, or has an intense dislike? Can, can, you, can you share why? I thought uh, WinRAD was not. HDSDR is. And uh, the other popular one was... Um, um, the other popular one was w, WR Plus. That was also closed, and that's actually since been commercialized into Studio One. So I, I suppose they uh, wanted to turn a buck out of it. I'm sure there is. Ah, oh, thanks for that. I, uh, I will install WinDebug and investigate for next time. Where are we? That's pretty impressive, but you know, when, by the time Windows 7 came along, that stuff got really rare. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite surprised. You've got real talent. <laughs> All I did was plug in the, uh, the dongle that's used for, the, for this, and that's, that's just an HID. All right. Fingers crossed. I hope it wasn't that one slide. I don't know. I don't have anything fancy like videos or anything here. So where were we? All right. So read the motor manual is where we were at. All right. So you, once once you have identified these things, you may still know your convolutional encoding, but you need to try different mappings of the symbols, whether there's differential encoding going on or so on. So there are a lot of different permutations. If the code is punctured, then you have a whole bunch of rates you need to try. Uh, now, the neat thing is that if you don't actually know anything about the data that would come out of your convolutional decoder, you can still look at the bit array to determine whether you have those correct parameters. Uh, so you can do some simple little tricks in GRC to figure out what the order of the modulation is, so whether it's um, QPSK, BPSK, 8PSK, and the symbol rate. Uh, so let's actually go through one. This is coming off a, a yet another transponder, a whole bunch of narrowband signals. And <laughs> I like to stay. <laughs> it's an ad came pre-installed and I, I don't want to have it set itself up. All right, so uh, you feed it through, once again, this channel selection filter to narrow in on one particular stream. And then all you do is you take your complex baseband symbol and raise it to a power. And that's a very quick and easy way of actually discovering the order of your PSK modulation. So here the exponent was originally 2, which would map to BPSK, if we take it to four, then you see you get the center peak and the two peaks on the side, and that's indicative of uh, QPSK. And all you need to do is use this power block and change the exponent and then take the EFFT. That's also fun, just for everybody to, to work with frequency offset. That's a good way to determine how far up frequency you are in each of your courses. Exactly, yes. Thank, thanks for mentioning that. So as it happens here, I, I tuned ahead of time, so this center peak was, was perfectly aligned at, at zero. But... Um, Tom just mentioned that, in fact, if you were slightly off frequency, that peak would still be in the center of this, uh, this hill, but it wouldn't match up with zero, so you can actually fine-tune then and ensure that it lines up to, um, to give you good decoding results further down the line. So the next thing is that uh, now, sure, you might know the, the order of the modulation, but you also need to determine the rate at which your symbols are coming down the line. And you can figure that out by using this construction, if there's periodicity within your signal, then you simply multiply the original signal by a delayed version of itself, and then, once again, take the FFD. Uh, here, you will see you get peaks, and the very first peak is actually the periodicity of your signal. And what do you know? It's 9600 board. The next stage is to put it through uh, the convolutional decoder and once again, I was telling you that you've got a whole bunch of different parameters, different rates you need to try. Uh, for a while, I did actually sit there and click on every single one of them, and it took forever. 
Uh, and that's why I decided to write another block that I'll show you in a second. But the, the point is that this is just the default configuration. You can see here you've got this error rate coming out. And I modified the Viterbi decoder to actually uh, keep a track of the path metric as it would be doing the decoding. And that's actually what is output by this block. And the cool thing is that when you line up and select the right parameters, then that will drop to zero. And so you know that you've actually locked on and you have the correct uh, settings selected. So this is the, the phase shift that was originally applied to the demodulator and then the correct uh, matrix for the depuncture. And um, so this is a, a sort of test flow graph. This is just using a GLFSR source. I go through, uh, modulate it there. I think that's differential QPSK. Uh, add some noise and then bring it back through to the MPSK receiver. Here you can select those parameters, the phase offset and so on. Uh, bring it around, do some more sort of uh, fiddling with the bits, whether you need to advance one or, or go back one if you're dealing with um, a QPSK. And then it goes into the uh, CCSDS decoder to do that NASA K7 um, deconvolution. And then it outputs the, the bytes there, but then you also get that metric that I was graphing before. So that's, that was just a, a test. And then you can use the error rate block to figure out whether you're doing things correctly. If, um, if it's not as obvious as 9600 and it's some other ridiculous rate, especially if you have um, wider band signals, then you can simply use the FFT block and dump it to disk, put it into uh, GNU plot. There's a little script I wrote that would cut up um, subsequent FFTs and then just plot them over one another and then you see these, these you know, obviously stand up peaks that line up exactly with some odd board rate they would be using for that particular link. Um, so that is just done by this little construction here, FFT, stream to vector and then to disk. Uh, this is the more complex graph that actually um, sort of forms the basis of that GUI I was showing you before. I tried to do everything in GRC. Um, so you have your other, your file source or your UDP source if you're going to stream from um, something else like HDSDR with BOR IP. Um, so that just streams the baseband over um, UDP. I originally did all this with a USRP1, which is a, a USB device, and I wanted to be able to kind of have the baseband come up and then click things on HDSDR and have uh, GNU Radio automatically tuned to the, the thing that I clicked on. So that's kind of a neat way of combining those two pieces of software. Uh, so you have your MPSK receiver here with a debug output, and then I won't bother going through the rest of it, and you get the idea. Um, and this one here actually does uh, that decoding I was telling you about, so you can pick your different um, depuncture matrices and different parameters. But as I was saying, it would be nice if it was automated. And this is why I, I created the auto fec block. So you pass your symbols in there. It will actually go through and try every combination, every, every permutation of, of the possible parameters until it uh, sees the bit error rate drop uh, dr dramatically, and then it'll signal a lock and output the bytes. So this is the kind of output you would see in the console. You have your initialization stuff, the, the parameters that you set up, and then it would constantly measure the bit error rate, and it would apply rotations to your... Um, constellation and, and conjugation and so on, and we go through all the options. And then eventually, when it sees it, it says it's locked and prints out the, the parameters. Um, and obviously, you know, this works for the, the K7 NASA encoder, but if you, you know, going to turbo, then it's a whole new world. Um, so here, this is, again, doing the demodulation, and that little block just sits there instead of having that mess before. A little bit cleaner, I suppose. Uh, so again... These are the sorts of numbers that came out on that stream we were looking at. Now we have a, a raw data output. If you visualize that, then obviously there's still not much there because it's scrambled. So you need to descramble it. I tried a couple of descramblers, and I, I picked that Intel business, that one, and then you have some structure there. Uh, but you have long lengths of zeros and ones, so it's probably differentially encoded. If you do that, then you see these structures appearing, and, and then I think... Um, you know, you can, you, you can pretty well say that you're onto something. So then it was actually a matter of figuring out those specific repeating structures because obviously there's going to be some sort of header or preamble that it, it would be picked up. And then there was another little program that would take in the bit stream and then look at different lengths of bit sequences and see how they would match up throughout the entire bit stream. And then you would look at the statistics and then it would give you a good clue as to the actual bit stream that was in use. So you can uh, pick that out and then... 
you eventually find out that it's a character-oriented uh, protocol. So you have your since and sin at the beginning, and then start of header, start of text, end of text, CRC. It's not, actually, I'm not sure what it is. I spent a long time trying to figure out what it was, but, uh, and I read up about that extensively, but it's not, not quite that. Uh, anyway, when you actually look at this over time, I think the recording was about two minutes long, and you finally do all the processing and you figure out which bytes refer to the ID and so on, you actually realize that it's, it seems to be some sort of telemetry, some sort of measurement that's being sent out. Uh, I reckon potentially from different points around the country up to the satellite being beamed back to a central station, but you know that's just conjecture. Uh, and you actually see that there are these measurements that are going on within each, um, each frame, and each frame re relate. It's basically an interleaved uh, sort of 18 groups of measurements re re repeating constantly. And excuse me. Uh, and so there are, you know, six have been signed measurements and then eight bit signed measurements and also, I don't know why, <laughs> they've also put in some BCD there, which is kind of, kind of weird. Uh, and last night I thought about actually graphing this stuff. The really cool thing would have been if I could have recorded, say, a week's worth of data, done this, and then graph the entire thing. And then you can try and, and match that against um, sort of natural events or the progression of time or, or sort of human behavior to try and figure out what was going on. But if you would graph it, um, so what I've done is I've taken these as X and Y um, and these other little 8-bit um, signed uh, bytes there, then you, know, you can see interesting patterns coming out. This is obviously two minutes worth, but it's some sort of analog measurement that's moving around. Um, maybe when I visit Australia, I'll, I'll try capturing some more, I don't know. But uh, anyway, that's, that's just the, the start. And as you saw, there are some tricks that you can do. This is uh, another frequency off the same satellite. This looks like some sort of TDMA. You might have some sort of um, burst preamble there at the beginning and then a burst of data. Could it be VSAT? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, this one really got me. I thought, well, you know, there's some sort of narrow band stream here. They've got some sort of data I put into the system. I could not get anything to lock on at any stage. And after pulling my hair out and doing some more research, I found the, uh, the spectrum listing for an American... Uh, geostationary satellite and as it turns out they actually have test channels and what do they broadcast they don't broadcast data they broadcast white noise so the entire time I was trying to demodulate <laughs> noise so that that was uh, a bit of a learning experience uh, so that's that's the satellite stuff going again back to Frank of Radio Roush fame he put together this auto correlation uh, GUI interface for GNU radio and in this instance, he's looking at GPSL1. Obviously, you don't ever see it on the FFT. But if you do do the autocorrelation, uh, then you know that there's a cyclic repeating code of this length at this chip rate. And so you get the one millisecond um, spike. And this indicates that there's that periodic one millisecond component to your signal. Uh, I took his code and, and poured it to the new world and, and put it into this block. So you can just get some sort of signal source. Uh, you know, uh, 2.1 gigahertz 3G or, or um, at 850 or L1, and then you can obviously do the same thing. Uh, here we have the 10 millisecond repeating uh, information in the common pilot channel uh, in UMTS. Uh, if you did it with Tetra, you can see the repeating idle, uh, idle pattern on the control channel, um, and then you know you can go ahead and try demodulating that. Uh, this is also another little block that draws upon um, some great work that Max did for the OP25 project. This is just a, another block that you can throw in, just an eye diagram, so you can see uh, for Tetra again, you can see the four uh, levels there. Um, and if you look at HF, then there's a military mode that I think occupies, what is it, about 2.8K or something like that? No, 3K. Uh, and it's used by the military. In fact, there's, there are quite a few French stations out there, and they repeat this constant message, uh, which is the French equivalent of um, the quick brown fox jump to the lazy dog. So it's just a test message. And if you look up some stats, then you can find out uh, what sort of modulation is used and so forth. But if you were to put that signal without knowing into um, that same flow graph, then you can see that you have a peak here at 2400 board. Um, and if you do the fast order correlation, then you have this peak coming out. And if you have you know, in your head, I suppose, or on a piece of paper, all the possible modulations, then you can look at this and, and compare. And as it turns out, uh, this 
106.666 repeat a millisecond uh, peak here in the fast order correlation uh, is that periodic component of Stanag when you look at the frame structure. So they have channel probes and they have a preamble and that repeats all the time. So that's what is causing this, this peak to come out. Um, and then with Stanag, it's 8PSK. So if you put that through, you can actually decode that as well. Uh, and just a quick final word, I suppose. Um, the cool thing about Frank's original block is that it, it draws upon uh, a very quick and efficient way of computing the fast order correlation, which is just taking the FFT of the power spectrum. Uh, so there's really not much in terms of sort of additional stuff. It's just hooking up some existing uh, GNU Radio blocks. Uh, we spoke, uh, not me, but we had a, a great talk about DRM today. And DRM is obviously on IHF as well. This is a DRM radio station that I was picking up and capturing. Uh, and I found this paper a while back on uh, actually doing some blind analysis. And, and originally, um, I wanted to create this mesh, so I used MATLAB. <coughs> but um, you'll see that it can be done very easily. In Didn't say anything. Um, in GNU Radio as well. So what this is actually showing you is, is you take a chunk of your signal of a fixed length and then you uh, take a sort of a proceeding amount by a certain lag and you keep multiplying those signals across one another. You take the complex conjugate of one and you keep multiplying and then you take the FFT. So if you look at uh, slices of this, it's just an FFT of different lags being built up. Uh, and with DRM, because it uses OFDM, you have... Uh, your unguided symbol time, and you have the you know that periodic component to your OFDM uh, signal due to the cyclic prefix as well. So my goal here was I knew it was DRM, but I wanted to figure out which class of DRM because as we heard, there are different uh, levels of protection depending on the sort of channel you expect, and I wanted to figure out whether it was you know A through to E. Uh, so you can feed your data through, and if you look at um, one one view, then you figure out here your unguarded symbol time. It's very easy because these peaks appear, again, where you have your uh, periodic components. And if you want to look at the total symbol duration, then you look down the other perspective, and that's the periodicity. So you, you take the inverse, and that's the total duration of symbol. Then you can figure out the guard interval itself. Um, and as it turns out, it's actually class B. And the cool thing about OFDM is that if you take the inverse of the unguarded symbol time, then you get the subcarrier spacing as well. So you can sort of apply this potentially to other OFDM signals too. Uh, this was the construction here. Um, salient blocks here, you have the uh, fast order correlation that's just coming in off the baseband. Uh, and then you have, once again, your baseband going through a variable delay. And then you end up taking the fast order correlation of that Again, so what it looks like when you actually do it. This is the, the baseband one. So once again, you have your 21.33 millisecond peak coming out there. And what you do is then you take that and you compute that in terms of sample length. Put that into your variable delay. So that'll actually, if you remember that big mesh, you've computed the amount that you have to go out from the center to get that. Uh, long line of dots that's symmetric on either side due to uh, the nature of O of DM. When, once you put that in, then you'll be multiplying the original signal by a lag of itself at this lag, and then you get that other cross section. So you get the other peaks coming out, and that is in fact um, that other magic number that will reveal what class of uh, signal it is. So that was the, the total symbol time. So th I've covered a, a couple of blocks here. Um, they're all in GRBAS. Um, and that's you know, freely available if you want to get it and test it out and hack on that. Um, I really would like to move to, to CMake because it's, it's getting kind of old and, and fit in with uh, the excellent way things are going. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. We have a question down the back. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself anywhere near an expert because this is kind of all self-taught. Um, but it, it essentially comes down to... 
I beg your pardon. So the question was to explain a little bit about what cyclostationary analysis actually is. And um, so I, I you know, defer to the experts out there, but from my understanding is when you have a signal with some sort of periodic component, then you can exploit that by doing this sort of analysis. And regardless of, of what the raw data is, you can have um, these, you know, if you eventually do the analysis, have these features pop out that reveal... Um, you know certain aspects of of that signal, and the other other, I mean, my favourite um, use of it is with CDMA. So you have all these signals that are laid on top of one another, but if there's any sort of repeating component in that, that will pop out. Um, so that's that's kind of the the simple version. Um, now, if I, I don't know whether this is going to work. If I switch over to the Linux box and detect displays. Uh, how do you enable this one? Twin view. Um, shit. I'm trying to use the um, NVIDIA X server thing, but I can't quite <laughs> remember how to turn on the external display. There's no apply button. I've detected the display, but it still says it's disabled. Um, I just click your click timer and detect displays. Configure. In view, okay, and then yay! All right. So what I'm going to do is on on this computer. In fact, I should have left it in to show you. But um, if I open up those recordings I made, I recorded them originally with um, HDSDR. This is just a really way of, of bringing up on the spectrum um, and hitting record. They go to WAV files, and there's also um, some patches on my wiki that, uh, for example, add a patch to the um, WAV source block. HDSDR stores some metadata in there, and if you try and open those WAV files with the WAV file source, it uh, doesn't like it. So. It um, it handles those. Uh, no USRP connected. Let me just open up this recording. Okay, so that's you probably can't see this. But that, um, that's HDSDR. You might be able to see the sort of familiar brown thing. And, and that picture of the narrowband signals is what's coming out on the waterfall there. So um, I have a plug-in for that that uh, takes that baseband and sends it out over UDP, both from file replays and uh, if you have a, some sort of SDR connected, it'll relay that over to, um, to your laptop. And you can see here in the yellow network all the packets are coming in. Now if I can find this window... Uh, this is that crazy flow graph, and uh, it's using uh, bore IP. Bore IP is just a really, really simple way of, of wrapping baseband data in UDP packets. All it does is add a little header with um, some flags and a sequence number, so that if you end up dropping any data, instead of getting the you know the UO USRP overrun, you get the you get the BO down there. Um, and my laptop can't quite keep up, I think. So where's the flow graph? Here we are. All right, so this is the little thing again. That's your baseband. Um, I've tuned. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite fit on the screen, but you can use these two sliders to do coarse and fine tuning. Um, this is one particular narrowband signal. You've obviously got the scope there. You've got the DMOD, and we know already that it's 96K. Oops. 96. Right. Um, I've made some modifications to the constellation plot so that you can change the board rate at runtime. 
uh, and that means that you can also use these um, other sliders, coarse and fine, to sort of tweak it if, you, if you're just trying to discover exactly what the rate is. Um, again, we've got the... I have to put it on repeat. There we go. We've got the power block. So this is to the power of two. Um, obviously, we don't have a peak there. And if we take it to four... Oh, I really should put some sort of AGC or something in there so you don't have to follow it all the way up the, the thing. Oh, yeah. That's also annoying. All right, so there we have the, um, that center peak. And, and obviously, um, if you were off frequency, then you could use that center peak to nicely bring it back. And also, if you use different sorts of modulations like GMSK um, and various other ones, then you see different behavior exhibited here. So some of them actually have no center peak and you only have the two little um, tips coming out the side. So that's also a hint as to what sort of um, modulation is being used if it's not phase shift keying. Um, doing the cyclo, you see that it, you have that peak at uh, 9.6K. Uh, fast autocorrelation. Well, in this particular signal, there's no clear repeating component to it. So, in fact, it... Yeah, they, that, that's right. Yeah, thank, thanks for mentioning that. So, if you actually have a look, if you center it properly, then you can actually... Um, deduce the board rate from there as well because these will sit at positive and negative uh, 9600. Um, so there's no periodic component within this particular signal. Uh, you saw that visualization again in black and white and it was just all over the place whenever there was a data packet it would get sent through. Uh, so you actually see no peaks coming out on the autocorrelation. Um, And so the other thing to do is if you're dealing with some sort of signal that can go through the quad D mod, then um, you can do that same sort of analysis only with the floating stream instead of the complex one, and you will similarly see the uh, the peak coming out. What's this one? I think that's that's yet another way of doing it. I can't quite remember how. If you wanted to really speed this up. Uh, I always I prefer RGB2 myself. Um, then that can be handy. In fact, this this was quite cool because um, on HF you also have over the horizon radar, and they use um, essentially just sweeping pulses. If you speed this up enough, you can actually see the individual pulses uh, as they cross through the the spectrum. So that's kind of neat. Um, and these were various things that I have to say. Well, if you're doing sort of manual demodulation, then obviously you know about the scope in, in XY mode. But again, this is just a you know one flow graph, and I've used this on countless occasions with terrestrial signals, you know how it's, there are so many signals out there. You can just put it through something like this and, and get some uh, initial insight as to what is actually going on and then write more advanced stuff after that, like uh, some of the other things we've seen today. So that's it. Thank you very much.